Today's data center is in many ways simply a centralized location where all the storage and processing is happening. And as our collective data consumption continues to grow exponentially, this is also an area shaped by the realities, the physics involved in making all this work. The judicious use of electrical power may be the single most important thing we can address in technology these days. And when you examine where most of that power is being used, you quickly settle on the data center. Servers are the greatest power consumers in the data center and they're often the most lightly loaded. To put it another way, they have a much higher capacity for work than they're generally asked to do. So the question then becomes, how much work should a server be doing to put itself in the most ideal range? Well, it turns out that anything less than 60 to 70 percent is low. And this implies that the best way to save power may be to get rid of the lightly loaded servers. But how much of a difference could this make? Well, looking at some statistics that as an industry, say we have server utilization running at five to ten percent and those same servers are using seventy percent of the power if we can somehow combine say five of these servers into one the load goes up twenty five to fifty percent and power consumption is reduced fourteen percent net savings fifty six percent now that's worth writing home about so what just happened here well we virtualize those servers this basically means that we were able to simulate a hardware environment in software multiple applications think they're running in the pristine environment that software developers always insist upon and it works really well and it's gotten very very popular in fact according to Gartner virtualization is the highest impact trend in infrastructure and operations through 2012 it will transform how IT is managed what is bought how it is deployed how companies plan and how they are charged now really as networkers eh, we're not surprised Virtualization has been in our blood since we configured our first ISL VLAN and saw the benefits in traffic management and system resources. But at the upper layers of the stack, it literally changes everything. Not just huge gains in efficiency and utilization, but virtualization enables load balancing and disaster recovery options that were never possible before. Now, using a lot of electricity also means creating a lot of waste in the form of heat. Reducing the electrical demand is one part of the equation, but there will always be heat to get rid of, and that involves cooling. Data centers are actually hitting limits on how much heat can be removed, and they have to play by some very specific rules concerning servers per square foot. There is a direct correlation between the amount of watts available per square foot and the watts available on a per rack basis. And this translates to, we may have uh, physical space for more servers, but we can't power or cool them. This means we are now power constrained and it's happening to everyone. Now, server technology has evolved over time, of course, but somehow this has never been able to address these fundamental problems. Standalone servers became thinner rack mounted servers, which then became even thinner blade servers. And they continue to get smaller and more powerful as technology naturally does, but the siloed nature of the development has meant that the big picture was constantly ignored. Server technology could not make significant advancements by only focusing inwardly. Virtualization has taken off like wildfire, but most servers still run a single OS and a single application per server because it's easy. And this has led to what is now termed server sprawl. A whole bunch of servers with really low utilization, lots of wasted space, power, and cooling. Confusing attempts to address the situation by bolting on multiple management applications on the outside has resulted in a frightening mess of cables and inefficiency. So, all that evolution and not so much accomplished you begin to realize that all of the server evolution up till now has been one of size, not really a significant change in the model. It turns out virtualizing a server solved one set of problems while also creating some new ones. Now you can't fault the server vendors really. It's, I mean, it's not easy to make big changes when things have always been done a certain way. A fresh set of eyes with permission to start from scratch appears to be just what the customer ordered. The Cisco Unified Computing System represents a new model that started from scratch. Multiple bottlenecks in the old model had to be overcome, however, and understanding these is crucial to appreciate what's been accomplished. The Cisco Unified Computing System dramatically reduces the limitations present in current server deployments. Cisco UCS was born to support virtualization and take it beyond the baby steps introduced with the server-only model by adding virtualization of network and storage in a completely new and integrated way. <laughs> data center folks used to say, Cisco, what does a networking company know about data center? You know, the network engineers are trying to figure out why anyone considers virtualization new. Because they've been working with VLANs, VRF, VPNs, and uh, they say, what took you so long? Now, though virtualization has enabled increased utilization of compute resources and thus reduced cost through consolidation in the overall number of servers, these costs have simply shifted to software and network resources. 
Organizational costs have risen due to additional roles, such as virtualization administrators and developers. Costs also have risen since more coordination is required because of the high complexity and high touch created by organizational overlaps. In fact, the majority of IT operational costs are spent on simply maintaining systems as opposed to developing new applications and enhancing value. There are better ways to go about this. The Cisco Unified Computing System is a system based on the natural aggregation point that exists in any data center, the network. The hard part is letting go of, this is how we've always done it, and there's a beautiful simplicity to the approach. Let me explain. The three most important subsystems to any server are memory, I.O., and processor, or CPU. If our goal is to optimize workload and do it with as few resources as possible, we need to address the bottlenecks created by these subsystems. Now, there are really only three options for doing this. You could increase the number of servers, but more servers just means more of everything we're trying to get away from, right? More power, more heat, more cables, complexity. Or two, you could increase the number of sockets per server. More sockets may allow for more memory, but these guys are expensive, and this is going to quickly double our application costs. Or three, you could increase the memory capacity per server. Now, this could be a big one, but industry consensus has always been that we were already maxed out in that area. Or were we? Intel came out with a new chip architecture, the Xeon 5500, as they usually do, and all the top server vendors are taking advantage of it. But only Cisco approached Intel and said, hey, we can take this further. Cisco created a way to map four physically distinct standard memory modules, those are called DIMMs, to a single logical DIMM as seen on the processor's memory channel. This yielded 48 standard slots, that's cheap memory slots, compared to only 12 that you'd find on a normal server. This now allows up to 192 gigabits of memory using standard 4 gigabit modules. That is a whopping 48 gigabit advantage over other common servers. Heck, you could even go to 384 gigabit using industry standard 8 gigabit DIMMs, but what's the rush? In a nutshell, we now get four socket performance at the two socket price. This amounts to huge savings on application costs and, of course, unrivaled utilization. Cisco memory extensions, the first of our three bottlenecks, now resolved. And we're just getting started. Our second bottleneck, I.O. or input-output. Why? Well, the drive to consolidate data center networks onto a single platform is as old as data center networks themselves. The 80s and 90s saw the replacement of other data center networking technologies with Ethernet and ultimately TCP IP over Ethernet. The 90s saw the replacement of several older storage interconnects with fiber channel. You know, truthfully, voice over IP really deserves the majority of the credit for I.O. consolidation. Being so time sensitive, voice over IP pushed network gear to lower and more predictable latencies. And this set the stage for what we can now do. Uh, of course, the need for speed continued, and the growth in demand for denser 10 gigabit Ethernet allowed Cisco to develop latency reduction techniques like cut through routing instead of store and forward, and TCP offload engines, which dumped the administrative overhead of TCP onto specialized ASICs, speeding header processing and freeing the CPU for other work. It's these technologies that really pave the way in high performance fabrics, and this is a good thing since today our, our connections run amok. We have literally been overrun with network interface cards, host bus adapters, cables, and switches, each of which must be powered, cooled, and, of course, configured. And this is a huge issue for data center design since every I.O. method has to be original for each bus design, each vendor driver set. And there's, of course, latency variation, plus one I.O. for storage and one I.O. for network and, uh, and one for inter process control. This has become a mess. To consolidate I.O. effectively, it must accomplish four key principles, each one setting up the other. Standardization of server platforms is what allows data center geeks to create compute pools with the ability to devote each application the amount of processing power dictated by demand and priority. And this leads to pooling of resources, which depends on this standardization. When the use of a network link becomes a matter of how systems use the single infrastructure and not which infrastructure is used, it's easier to pool the resources and make them uniformly available, which allows dynamic and rapid provisioning. This is where the rubber hits the road. It's a result of the creation of these resource pools. Once fabrics are standardized and can be pooled, data center geeks can manually, or through automation, redirect resources to meet new needs driven by changes in performance, business continuity requirements, or application priority on the fly with just a policy change. With this in place, we get flexible allocation. The dynamic provisioning of pooled resources, the ability to reallocate bandwidth and resources anywhere it is needed, regardless of geography, at a moment's notice. 
Cisco UCS has the ability to reduce all these connection points in a positively svelte manner with standards-based extensions to 10 gigabit Ethernet. This technology, referred to as unified fabric, makes it possible for all virtual and physical machines to have identical network characteristics, no matter their function or their unique requirements, and provides a dramatic reduction in connections. <sighs> a return to simplicity. But that still leaves us one final bottleneck. Our third and final bottleneck is the CPU, or Central Processing Unit. Let's start with something I think is key here. Virtualization breaks relationships. Think about it. How ingrained is the following? Each physical network access port corresponds to a single physical server port, which is running a single application, and thus we can always apply policy at this static point. <laughs> Not anymore. Virtualization means that one physical server could have many different applications, many different operating systems and network needs, plus they may move around, and you probably want them to move around. And they certainly will need to communicate among themselves, which is extremely dangerous for security, for policies, heck, for communication between network and server folks, which is the reality of getting things done. Cisco worked with VMware to virtualize the network interface and created groundbreaking visibility into this virtualized world, reestablishing broken relationships that needed healing. Portable port profiles can now be used in a dynamic, templated fashion, set up by the server folks with input from the network team and administered by just about anybody. These software-based interfaces bring network familiarity back to our virtualized chaos so that security and policy can once again be applied and measured. The brokered communication from virtual machine to virtual machine even allows the data path to bypass the hypervisor and free up the CPU cycles, thus eliminating our final bottleneck. Can you see it now? This is just the high level. There's so much more to dive into, and it's really quite interesting. Cisco did not get into the server business to make servers. Cisco truly revolutionized what we really wanted our technology to do for us all along. Store, compute, and serve up my data whenever, wherever I need it as efficiently and flexibly as possible. Cisco UCS is a lean, mean computing machine, removing unnecessary switches, adapters, and management modules. One third less architecture compared to classical blade servers. Tastes great, less filling. I don't want to argue. You know what this means? Less power simply means less cooling, less management points, more reliability. It's all in the network. The true unification of compute, network, and storage with a bottom line benefit that cannot be ignored.